let's cast our minds back to 2008. So that's when the original i10 launched and it was a very successful model for the Korean brand in Europe, accounting for more than a third of city car sales in the continent across the six years it was available. This latest third generation model arrived in 2020 and it brought with it sharper styling, a roomier interior and more advanced technology than before alongside a range of small capacity powertrains effectively blending performance with running costs. So which i10 is best for your needs? Should you consider the sporty i20N variant? And how does it compare to other city cars on the market like the Suzuki Ignis, Toyota Igo X and the absolutely gorgeous Kia Picanto? Well, we'll find out in this review, but before we do guys, you can click that pop-up banner up there to head over to OSV's site and check out all our offers available on the i10 and make sure to subscribe as well to keep up to date with our in-depth vehicle reviews. Hyundai claims the i10 is a small car that makes a big statement and I have to agree with this young, sleek and dynamic profile allowing it to stand out from other offerings in the segment. As standard you get halogen running lights, you'll have to upgrade to premium and endline models to get bifunction projector headlamps with front fog lights and these come fitted with high beam assist enabling you to receive maximum visibility for nighttime driving. At the side, we can evidence that the car's sleek and dynamic design is contrasted against soft lines and smooth surfaces. As we can see, we've got a line there that runs all the way across the car and up to the tailgate. It's a rather effective look. Down here, 14-inch steel wheels as standard. If you climb up the range, the SE Connect models, these are slightly larger at 15 inches, and then you get 16 inches with premium models, and an N line as a sportier design to these. There's quite a lot of colors to choose from with the i10. We've gone with the sleek silver metallic shade. That will set you back around 550 pounds. I quite like the standard mangrove green, though. It's a color you don't really see come as standard with a car, but it really works for the i10. You can also have a two-tone colour scheme going on if you go with premium or N-line models, so you can have a black roof and mirrors plus your desired body colour. Do get in touch with our team if you'd like to explore these colour options in more detail. This version of the i10 has a lower roof and a wider body compared to its predecessor. The length comes in at around 3,670 millimetres, so it's quite a bit longer than the Kia Picanto, the Fiat 500 and the VW Up. It's quite a bit wider than a lot of the cars in its segment too, but it sits lower than its major competition. Uh, it's around the same height as a Seat Me, and we'll hop inside later on to see if that's compromised headroom in any way. Overall though, it's quite a bit smaller than one of the country's best budget options, the Dacia Sandero. Not a huge fan of the i10's rear design. It looks a little, little bit bland and it just simply doesn't stand out from the competition. I prefer the muscular and attractive looks of the Suzuki Ignis. But you do get a large pane of rear privacy glass with high spec grades and N-line models add twin exhaust pipes along the bottom. Upon opening the tailgate, you're rewarded with 252 litres to play with. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but it's pretty good for a city car. By comparison, the Igo X offers a measly 231 litres, and this is just a few litres shy of the Kia Picanto's 255 litre capacity. A larger vehicle like the Dacia Sandera gives you in excess of 320 litres, but yeah, the i10 is a lot smaller. So this is a very practical space for the size on offer here. That translates to around two to three small carry-on luggage or one to two larger adult suitcases. Two at a push though, you'll likely have to take this parcel shelf off and dump it elsewhere in the cabin. The lift in height is around 29 millimeters lower than its predecessor. And just take a look at how low that loading lip is. It makes it so easy to get those heavy and awkwardly shaped items into the back coupled with that nice squared off opening there. That's pretty much your lot. There's not a lot going on with this boot space. We don't have any hooks dotted around to attach objects. We don't have compartments on the left or right hand side. We do have some underfloor storage, but that's mainly reserved for the maintenance kit. Yeah, it's pretty bare bones in the back here. If you need to extend capacity further, perhaps you need to use the i10 for the trip run or you want to fit your bike in the back, which you can do because I did it. I did it the weekend. It just about fit if you take the front wheel off. You have to fold down the seats. Uh, let's take the parcel shelf off so we get a better look at what that procedure is like. We can then fold them down from the back here. They fold in a 60-40 configuration, awarding you with 1,046 litres in total. 
when you fold the seats down, you'll notice that they don't fold completely flat. And look at that gap there between the seat backs and the floor. That means loading long objects into the rear cabin space might be a little bit fiddly, but yes, you can fit a bike in the back here and it should be more than suitable for a stroller. You know, there's occasional moments where you just need to extend capacity. The i10 accommodates that. One of my favorite aspects about the i10 compared to other city cars on the market is the driving experience. So let me tell you why. Let's get behind the wheel. Okay guys, there's three petrol variants available with the i10. Unfortunately, we don't have a fully electric or hybrid option, unlike key rivals like the Volkswagen Up. So the entry level option is a one litre MPI unit, and this comprises a three cylinder petrol engine driving the front wheels and that generates a whopping 66 horsepower and 97 newton meters of torque for a 0 to 62 time of a blistering 14.5 seconds. Indeed the i10 is much more suited for leisurely driving around town than racing up the M24 prepared to downshift quite frequently in order to rapidly gain speed. This can be had with either six speed manual or automatic transmission. I recommend you go with the manual though because the shifts are light, they're precise and responsive, provides a decent amount of driver engagement too. Automatic can feel quite lethargic, especially when setting off and standstill. The car is quite slow to respond and you do notice those, uh, those gear changes as the car struggles to process those. Um, as a result, it's not the most engaging option and also the automatic i10 is one of the slowest cars that you can buy currently in the UK. In terms of fuel economy, Hyundai claims you can achieve around 56.5 miles per gallon on the combined cycle, which is great, and I'm sure you'll be able to achieve that if you use the i10 purely as a city car. Taking a look at the trip in front of me, at the moment I'm averaging around 41 mpg, which is quite significantly lower than what Hyundai claim, but we are doing a mix of driving, a lot of B road and country roads, as well as faster A road. So yeah, perhaps take that figure with a pinch of salt. CO2 emissions for the manual variant are 119 grams per kilometre, while for automatic it's 126 grams per kilometre, both of which place the i10 in a relatively low benefit in kind tax band for 2022 to 2023. So it is a pretty good company car option if you want to go with a nippy city car. Next up the ladder, we have the 1.2 MPI unit, much more powerful. We've got a four cylinder engine driving those front wheels now, generating 83 horsepower and 118 newton meters of torque. That delivers a zero to 62 time of 12.6 seconds. Uh, of course, this is gonna be slower for the automatic transmission variant and you are gonna to wanna to hang around in those low rev ranges in order to gain enough speed to get anywhere. Miles per gallon's a bit worse with this unit. Expect to achieve around 52.3 mpg. Still good, but that weaker petrol option is much more fuel efficient. In terms of CO2, the manual output's around 126 grams per kilometer, and the automatic, 129 grams per kilometer. And finally, if you go with the N-Line model, you have the one liter TGDI unit, which once again is powered by a three cylinder engine driving the front wheels. This generates around 98 horsepower and 172 newton meters of torque for for a much improved zero to 62 time of 10.6 seconds, making it one of the faster city cars on the market. So if you do want that acceleration from standstill to get into those tight gaps in traffic around town, then this is the variant to go for also, especially if you love uh, sporty city cars. Uh, miles per gallon, you'll be achieving around 52 mpg on the combined cycle, depending on how you drive, of course, and CO2 emissions around 123 grams per kilometer. So it's again, placed in quite a generous BIK band. The i10 offers some of the best comfort in the city car class. Those largest 16 inch alloy wheels do a nice job at smoothing out light undulations around town. And you even find when driving on fidgety road surfaces that it remains rather composed, especially when up to speed on the motorway. I will say though, it's not as composed on poorly maintained B roads or country roads like the iGo X, which is much more built for those kind of road surfaces. But on the bright side, when you go over large humps and bumps around town, the ride doesn't feel as soft or bouncy as the Citroen C3. N9 models have a firmer ride due to stiffer springs, but you'll find when you drive over harsh abrasions that there isn't much of a thump throughout the cabin. Again, everything's quite composed. Hardly any vibration comes through the steering wheel either. 
When it comes to steering and handling, the i10's tight 9.7 metre turning circle coupled with the incredibly light steering makes the city car very easy to manoeuvre around town and into and out of tight parking gaps. The steering is light but I find it to be quite well weighted providing a decent amount of feel and feedback from those front wheels making it a quite engaging motor to swing around tight bends and wind down through country roads. Driving dynamics are certainly not class leading though, there's prominently more body roll than your experience with a Kia Picanto and it's just not as good as tackling country roads as the Igo X. But it does deliver the lightweight maneuverability that you'd certainly expect from a vehicle of this class. Let's talk about the pedals, they nicely line up with your feet and there's a nice sizable area to the left hand side to rest your foot. Loving that brake pedal, nice and firm so it's easy to modulate when you're going through slow start stop traffic. Visibility is very good for a small city car and that's thanks to the wide deep windscreen giving me a fantastic view of what's ahead of me. I can't even see the bonnet so it feels like I'm driving a hovercraft at times. Mirrors are nice and large too for a small car giving me a great view of what's behind me and thanks to slender uh, slim side pillars here your view at junctions and roundabouts aren't too obscured. My view over my shoulder though is obscured by shallow rear windows and the view at the back isn't too great either. Thankfully though with SE Connect trims upwards you get a rear view camera as standard but no parking sensors at all available on any of the trim levels which is quite an odd choice for a new car. In terms of noise and vibration it's actually pretty quiet inside here for a small car. Of course you'll hear some road noise start to seep in at those faster speeds on the motorway that can't really be avoided but if you're playing an album or podcast those sounds are relatively easily drowned out. There is quite a bit of wind noise coming from around the mirrors and the windscreen especially at faster speeds though and when you go over undulations and cracks in the road surface like we are now there is a little bit of shakiness inside here there's a little bit of reverberation but again I can't really be avoided for a small car. When the item was assessed by you at NCAP it was awarded three stars for safety which isn't one of the best results in the city car segment by comparison the Kip Canto scored four stars and the Ignis scored the maximum five stars. If you click that pop up banner up there by the way you can go ahead and watch our review of the Ignis and see what we make of that very capable city car. It scored well in the child occupant category though and it comes as standard with a wealth of safety features like automatic emergency braking, lane keep assist with departure warning, driver attention alert and forward collision warning. Hyundai's warranty is pretty good, it's five years and unlimited mileage. Not quite as good though as Kia's class leading seven year warranty that you get with the Kia Picanto. Though with a Hyundai you do benefit from five years worth of annual health checks and within the first year of ownership you get 24 hours of Hyundai breakdown assistance. Okay guys, this is the rear view camera display that you get with SE Connect trims upwards helping you maneuver into tight gaps in car parks or just a pretty deserted car park like this one. But have a look at those guidelines. Uh, they're really helpful with uh, helping you to maneuver into those spaces. I mean, you shouldn't have much of a problem anyway considering the size of the i10, but it's a very much nice to have. It's just a shame that we don't have parking sensors. As you see, we approach the curb there and there's no beeping or flashing from the system. The i10 boasts a stylish, clean and modern cabin with lots of technology packed in for a small car. Though the majority of the time you'll be staring at these high quality and robust plastics. That is to say there's not a whole lot of material variety on show but at least it all comes together rather nicely. For example we've got this honeycomb 3D effect on this white piece of plastic working its way across the dashboard. The infotainment unit itself is housed within this gloss black unit. We can see minimal use of chrome around the air vents, gear lever and doors. Yeah it's a nice effect and it makes the i10 feel a little bit more premium than its rivals as a result but I do miss soft touch materials. If you go with the N-Line model you benefit from the N-Line interior design pack which adds red accents around the interior here as well as red stitching on the steering wheel, gear lever as well as metal pedals so really bringing out the sporty appeal of the i10. The i10 offers a wide front space making it easy to stretch out and get comfortable and it gives you lots of room to breathe as well. You won't be touching shoulders with the front passenger. Headroom and legroom is pretty much on par with this car's sister, the Kia Picanto. Headroom at 5.8, look at that, absolutely miles away from the top of that roof line in there. So drivers who are 6 4 over should not have any issues. Legroom's pretty good too, thanks to great seat adjustability. So we can come back like so, and that rewards you with lots of legroom there. You can easily stretch out, find a comfortable position. 
Uh, if you want to pump yourself up high, you certainly can do in the i10 and get a lofty view of the road ahead over the bonnet. I mean, even at the lowest position, you'll struggle to see the bonnet, which is fantastic, giving you a very unobscured view of the road ahead. So yes, thanks to some great adjustment and a high roof line, very easy to get comfortable in the i10. SE and SE Connect trims have an obsidian black interior with white stripes on the seat. If you upgrade to the mid-spec premium model, then you get the shell grey interior package and that's what you see included here with this uh, white embellishment on the dashboard and again you get white stripes on the seats. And N-Line models have black sports seats with red stitching. Premium models also add heated front seats, so the front passenger and driver will have toasty buttocks on a cold winter's morning. I'm just disappointed that you can't get lumbar support for the driver and the front passenger's seat there, because I do find the seats to be exceptionally comfortable. That's thanks to these prominent side bolsters that hold you in place well when going around tight corners and bends. It's just when you start to embark on a longer journey, perhaps you're driving for longer than half an hour, I am starting to experience some discomfort on my lower back, and that could have easily been remedied by some lumbar support. You get a leather wrap steering wheel as standard and the size of this may look a bit overkill for an i10 but I think that was a great design decision because it provides an unobstructed view of the dials and screen behind it. As standard you get a 3.5 inch black and white display showing you very basic key information that you want to see while on the move such as average fuel economy data plus navigation directions if you've mapped a route from A to B. That's housed between your conventional rev counter dial and a speedometer. With entry level models, you don't even get a touch screen on the centre console. It's just a really basic display with DAB radio and Bluetooth. So you're going to want to ignore that completely and climb up to the SE Connect trim to benefit from the 8 inch touchscreen display. That adds wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to mirror your smartphone apps onto the screen, effectively bypassing Hyundai software. And if you go with the tech pack, you can add navigation to that display as well. With the tech pack, you also get a five-year subscription to Hyundai's Life Services, allowing you to easily locate POIs, as well as the availability and pricing of nearby parking. You also get a wireless phone charging pad down there and the center console. But back to the display, I actually really like Hyundai software here. It's easy to navigate around thanks to clearly defined menus and large icons. The graphics are de decently sharp too. There's just a little bit of input delay. This is definitely one of the weaker implementations of Hyundai software in one of their vehicles. So it can take a while to load some of those essential menus, but if you simply use this for, you know, playing an album or podcast, you know, connecting your phone up via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, it's perfectly functional for that, works really well. You'll also be able to register your i10 to the Blue Link app. That way you'll be able to remotely lock and unlock the vehicle from a distance, locate where it's parked in a crowded car park, as well as send navigation instructions directly to the infotainment screen. Sound system's all right, there's two speakers up front, and if you go with SE Connect models, there's another two added to the rear. It's not the most enveloping auditory experience you'll ever have, but it doesn't sound bad for a small car. As standard, you get manual air conditioning. You'll have to upgrade to premium or inline models to get climate control, but I absolutely love that these are all physical buttons. None of the controls for these are incorporated into the display. That means it's incredibly easy to change the air temperature and intensity using the dials here, and the buttons feel nice and tactile, the satisfying and easy to press when driving from A to B. Let's work our way down the centre console. So we've got a sizeable compartment here for your phone where the wireless phone charging pad would be with the high spec grades. We've also got a USB port and a 12 volt socket. We've got some controls here to enable your heated seats if you've got that with your particular version. Here's our six speed manual gear shift, which I really do enjoy. Manual handbrake, quite refreshing to see in a new car and that's accompanied by a couple of cup holders both of which are quite small no way you'll be able to fit a bulky bottle like this in there but on the bright side you do have a larger cup holder towards the back of the center console and there's another tiny compartment there perfect for spare change or your keys there's some additional storage space dotted around the front here. The glove box is a nice size, perfectly fitting the manual, and there's plenty of room in there for other bits and bobs. You've got a decently sized tray above that to put objects you want more easy access to. And the door bins are a really nice size too, easily eating up my bulky bottle. Rear space is decent, but certainly not as good as the Suzuki Ignis. Legroom's not too bad, but I can't stretch out all the way. My knees don't come up too high though, so I'm pretty comfortable there. Headroom is not bad, so as you can see there, 5.8, not too far off that roof lining. 
if you sit like that, you do approach it a little bit closer due to the roof lining just starting to approach the rear tailgate there in a swooping fashion. Also, if you've got three passengers in the back here and this one here is squished up against the window, they will be touching the top. As you can see there, the roof line dramatically comes down towards the window and yeah, you're gonna be sat like that, that's not comfortable. Niceties in the back are kept to a minimum. We don't even have pouches on the back of the front seats. The door bins are tiny, only enough room for a 250 mil bottle. And we don't even have a foldy downy middle seaty thing. As you can see, the seats fold in a 60-40 arrangement. For some reason, Hyundai deems it fit to call this bit a middle seat. I mean, look, look at the size of that. Let's slide over, see what that is like. And as expected, it's not great. Um, the plastic is digging into my back. Uh, we've got a decently sized central tunnel here that we have to straddle. We have to find place for our feet as a result. On the bright side, I've got a great view of the infotainment screen, but yeah, you're definitely not going to want to cram in three passengers into the back here. They're not gonna like you if you do. Okay then guys, there's four trim levels available with the i10. Let's run through what you get with each of those and the pricing so you can decide on which version's best. Entry level SE grade start from £13,400 and you get the smallest 14 inch steel wheels as well as electrically adjustable door mirrors and safety features like cruise control, lane keep assist and forward collision avoidance. I recommend you go with the SE Connect trim. That starts from £14,400 because you get this eight inch touchscreen display with Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto plus the rear view camera that shows dynamic guidelines when you're reversing. Premium models will set you back around £15,700 and you get these bifunction projection headlamps with LED daytime running lights and front fog lights. You also get rear privacy glass on the passenger window and tailgate and larger 16 inch alloy wheels. If you'd like to maximise the sporty potential of the i10, then consider going with the N-Line model for £16,800 because you benefit from the N-Line design pack that affects the alloy wheels as well as other exterior embellishments plus inside the cabin too. So if you want to find out more about this as well as discover the i10 that's perfect for your needs, then just get in touch with our team via the link below. All right then guys, is it worth buying, leasing or financing a Hyundai i10? Well, I've driven a fair few city cars for OSV, and I've got to say, this might just be my favorite, and that's due to a number of reasons. Firstly, the clean, uncomplicated styling has mass appeal. I absolutely love the drive. It's comfortable and quite enjoyable, whether you're moseying around town or you're up to speed on the motorway. It caters to lots of motorists in that regard. Inside, it's surprisingly spacious, perhaps not as much as the Ignis, but at least you get five seats here. The technology is intuitive. The boot space is great for a vehicle in this class, and it's generously equipped, coming with a lot of advanced features that are also available in cars that cost tens of thousands of pounds more. Any downsides? Well, unless you're choosing the i10 as your first car, I personally wouldn't bother looking at the one litre petrol option. It's just too underpowered, feels rather sluggish, and those zero to 62 times are rather depressing. Interior quality certainly isn't up to par with some rivals, and the i10 is more expensive than the majority of its competition. So you'll need to weigh up whether all that it does well is worth that premium over, say, the Ignis and the Picanto. Plus that three star safety rating, it doesn't mean that the i10 is unsafe, it just doesn't have as many of those advanced safety features as say the Ignis which was awarded five stars. But overall, I've got to say I love this car. I think it's a fantastic city option if you're just nipping around town to the shops or dropping your kids off at school. This is a very economical and enjoyable option that should most certainly be on your list of considerations. If you'd like to join me in getting an i10, then just get in touch with OSV's vehicle specialists via the number in the banner below. They'll be more than happy to help you out, explore your options, and then secure the version that perfectly suits your needs. Alternatively, you can just click that pop-up banner up there, guys, to book a call online. You can set your desired date or time, and we'll get in touch from there. And remember to click the link in the description to go over to the OSV website and browse all the offers we have available on this absolutely lovely city car. If you enjoyed the review guys, do give it a thumbs up. It really helps us out here at OSV. Also subscribe to the channel and make sure you've clicked the notification bell because that way you'll get notified when we upload the next review. But I think that's it for today. Thanks for watching, take care and safe driving. <laughs>